Hi, it's Dwyer. RichardDwyer.com, keepingitfree.blogspot.com. I'm an attorney in Northern California, civil attorney, not criminal attorney. Uh, these days I do primarily divorces for Silicon Valley clients. Let's talk about a very contentious case. It's split commentators. You have books on both sides of the aisle. You have people who feel that this individual was railroaded by the establishment, right? Let's get under the hood and let's look at the facts of the case. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, I'm in my 50s, right? My 50s. Understand, in the 1970s, the world was a little different, right? Now, over my shoulder here is actually a picture of my parents. My father, who I understand, um, you can't quite see the photo clearly, but trust me, my parents are with me every day spiritually. Now, my father was a social worker. And to keep me on the straight and narrow, right? He would point out cases like the Jeffrey McDonald case. He would point out that Jeffrey McDonald was a Green Beret and that the system possibly was failing Jeffrey McDonald. They were accusing him of the worst possible type of crime murdering his family, right? His wife is pregnant at the time. And back then in the 70s, before we had the resources we have now, right? Before we had widespread use of the internet, before we had websites that could dive deeply into cases, Websites that would enable viewers like you and me to look at actual trial transcripts. Before we had all of that, the public narrative was that Jeffrey McDonald somehow was found innocent. Right? Received an honorable discharge from the army. And then later, was somehow convicted of these terrible crimes after he had moved on in life, years after the murders took place. A delay that conceivably could have resulted in the loss of evidence, right? Witnesses with differing recollections, the loss of physical evidence, and things of that nature. So, let's just say the case is very contentious. It was a contentious one in my family. Understand, I knew about this case from when I was a little kid. This was a case on my father's mind. And understand, my father, very left of center, right? A bit of a hippie. A guy who raised me on Bob Marley music and stuff like that, right? My father, who wasn't the biggest fan of the United States military felt that this guy might have been railroaded. Now, before I go further, let me talk about the most important people in the case, right? This isn't my father talking, rest in peace. This is me talking as someone who has had the benefits of not only listening to my father, but of, right? online resources. Sites like the Jeffrey McDonald case .com, right? Reading books, paying attention to this case, going through law school and figuring out exactly what was going on procedurally in this case. The arguments that the attorneys raised, right? Jeffrey McDonald's right to a speedy trial. Whether or not Jeffrey McDonald 
was a victim of double jeopardy, right? Being tried for the same crime twice, having the system, the establishment ignore a not guilty verdict in convicting him, right? Well, let's talk about the most important people in the case as I see it. Just understand who they are. Colette McDonald. She marries Jeffrey in 1963. I want you to fully understand and grasp early in this video the magnitude of the brutality. She is clubbed. Both of her arms are broken. She stabbed 21 times with an ice pick. This is a pregnant woman. She stabbed another 16 times with a knife. On the headboard of her bed is the word pig written in blood. Right? Understand, I said she's pregnant. It was with the couple's third child, a son. Right, who also died. The couple's first child, another very important person, Kimberly, five years old. She's clubbed in the head, right? Clubbed in the head by a big 31 inch piece of wood. She's also stabbed in the neck, this five year old, eight to 10 times. Finally, there is Christian. Folks, she's two years old. Two. Right? She was stabbed 33 times with a knife. 15 times with an ice pick. And, of course, there is Jeffrey McDonald. McDonald suffered a concussion. Right? If you're a Jeffrey McDonald supporter, you believe the concussion was a significant one. If you're not a Jeffrey Donald supporter, you believe the concussion was a mild concussion. He had been stabbed on his left torso. Right? According to medical reports, it was a clean, small, and sharp incision. That punctures his lung. Now let's back up a second because I know if you're like me, you want to profile the accused a bit, right? Understand, Colette, Kimberly, and Christian are murdered as well as the couple's unborn son. They're not here, unfortunately to tell us what happened. The person who is, is Jeffrey McDonald, the accused. Let's find out a little bit more about him. Let me say this too. One of the best resources online, and it's unusual because I don't find this to always be the case, but for this case, one of the best resources online is the Wikipedia entry, right? The public is very involved in keeping track of this case. And they have done a phenomenal job collectively in preparing the Wikipedia entries for this case. I'm gonna read the first two paragraphs from Wikipedia, something unusual for this website, but I believe these two paragraphs tell you a bit about Jeffrey McDonald's background in a very succinct way, right? First two paragraphs, Wikipedia, as of today, Monday, August 13th, 2018, under the heading Early Life. Jeffrey McDonald was born in Jamaica, Queens, New York City, the second of three children of Robert McDonald, known as Mac, and his wife, Dorothy. Raised in Long Island, he attended Pachoke High School 
where he was both voted most popular and most likely to succeed. And he was senior class president and captain of the football team. His grades were high enough for him to win a scholarship to Princeton University. While there, he resumed a romantic relationship with Colette Catherine Stevenson, his high school sweetheart. On September the 14th, 1963, upon learning she was pregnant with his child, Kimberly, they married. Their daughter was born on April the 18th, 1964. After attending Princeton for three years, McDonald and his family moved to Chicago in 1964, <laughs> where he was accepted to Northwestern University Medical School. Their second child, Christian, was born on May the 8th, 1967. The following year, upon his graduation from medical school, he completed an internship at the Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center in New York. He joined the U.S. Army on July the 1st, 1969, and the entire family moved to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, where he held the rank of captain. He was assigned to the 6th Special Forces Group as a group surgeon in September of 1969. Suffice it to say, Jeffrey McDonnell was a guy with a very successful background up until the night of the murders. Right now, let me just say this. Right? What I want to do here is I want to actually read through <coughs> a published case that you can research, right? View this video as an entry point into the case. View it as not an end destination, but as the beginning of a journey where you can literally dive into the case and review the very things I'm reviewing to reach your own conclusion. Of all the videos I've done here online, this one has a lot of twists and turns. Jeffrey McDonald is one of the more interesting people to have been accused of a heinous, brutal crime. So what I'm gonna do here, to make sure the facts that are conveyed here accurately reflect what the government believes happened. What I'm going to do is read from U.S. versus McDonald. It's 640 F SUP 286. Again, that's 640 F SUP 286. Let me do this here too. I've noticed that a lot of people involved in the law have stumbled upon my videos here online. Right? The videos really are interactive. At the conclusion of the video, you actually have the opportunity to leave comments in the comment section. I want to invite people to do just that. Not just people in the legal profession, but also lay people with an interest in crime. Right? Because as I've said, there have been books written on both sides of the aisle. There are many people who are like my father, right? Who, who believe that this guy was railroaded by the establishment, right? So, from U.S. versus McDonald, 640 F sub 286, written by the trial judge, Judge Dupree. Here is what the court believed after trial happened on the morning of February the 17th, 
1970. In the early morning of February 17, 1970, McDonald's pregnant wife, Colette, and his two daughters, Christian and Kimberly, two and five years old, were clubbed and stabbed to death in their apartment in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. <clears throat> when military police arrived at the crime scene following a telephone call from McDonnell, they found McDonnell, a physician and captain in the Army Medical Corps, unconscious and lying partially across his wife's body in the master bedroom. Although McDonald had sustained a number of stab wounds, one of which partially collapsed the lung, he was treated at the Womack Army Hospital Emergency Room and released after a brief hospitalization. On the morning and afternoon of the murders and in subsequent interviews, McDonald told investigators that the murders had been committed by four drug-crazed intruders. He said that upon retiring at approximately 2 a.m. to 2.30 a.m., he found that his youngest daughter, Christian, had crawled into bed with his wife and had wet his side of the bed. He picked her up and returned her to her own room and then went into the living room to lay down on the sofa where he fell asleep. Sometime later, he was awakened by his wife and oldest daughter's screams and looked up to see a woman with blonde hair wearing a floppy hat, boots, and a short skirt carrying a lighted candle and chanting, Acid is groovy, kill the pigs. He said that three men, two white and one black, standing near the couch, then attacked him, pulling or tearing his pajama top over his head, which he then used to ward off their blows. The three attackers continued to club and stab him until he lost consciousness. When he awoke on the hall steps to the living room, McDonald stated that he got up and went to the master bedroom where he found his wife dead. He said that he pulled a Geneva forged knife out of her body and covered her with his pajama top and a bath mat. He then went to his children's rooms and unsuccessfully tried to revive them. After going to the bathroom to wash himself and calling the military police, he again lost consciousness. Now let's fine tune this video. Let's not try to get sidetracked by procedural questions like whether he got a speedy trial. Let's ask a more foundational question. Is he lying to the police? In my opinion, if he is lying to the police, then he did the crime. In my opinion, he did. In my opinion, he's guilty of these four murders, his wife, his two born children and his unborn child. He makes mistakes that in my opinion point to his guilt. Now for me and for everyone there's a different corner of this case that fascinates him. But for me one of the biggest problems I have with his explanation is that it doesn't make logistical sense. The more you listen to it, the more you start to ask yourself whether this is even possible. Right? He's in the living room. 
there are four intruders. Now he has neighbors, right? This is a crowded Fort Bragg. There are four people in the living room. Yet when he wakes up, he hears screams. How many people are in his house? There are four, there are four people in the living room. Right? Three men, one woman. Four. Who's attacking his wife and kids? As he's in the living room with the four people. Right? Just ask yourself. How many people are in the house? I believe McDonald that morning is making up facts that would require either a very loaded, very loaded single car, or more likely a van or multiple cars, which the neighbors don't see, to show up at the house, right? In other words, if you believe McDonald's statements to the police that he hears his wife and daughter screaming, Right? Understand, they're in different rooms. Right? Wife's in the master bedroom. His two daughters have their own bedroom. If he's hearing them screaming, then there would have to be at least two other people in the apartment. There'd have to be at least six people in the apartment. A crowd in the apartment. Not just four, because the four people are the people he wakes up to in the living room, right? In my opinion, the more people that he's claiming are in the apartment, the less likely this crime is, right? Understand, no one talks about seeing a big van show up with five or six people. No one. McDonald doesn't claim to have woken up with his wife screaming. Right? He hears the screams of his wife and kids. Right? Now, assuming they're attacked at the same time, that's two extra people on top of a woman who's been in the apartment long enough to have lit a candle and three guys who somehow have a 31-inch club with them. Let's talk about the club. The biggest problem number two in this case, in my opinion, is the fact that the weapons used in the attack seem to have all come from the McDonald residence. Right? McDonald talks about being hit with this piece of wood, which the police recover, right? It's 31 inches long. It's later found outside the back door, right? But understand, the police then, in researching this piece of wood, find out that the wood came from inside the house. Folks, it was identical in type, grain, and growth rings to a bed slab in his daughter Kimberly's bedroom. Right? The same wood used in Kimberly's bedroom matches this 31-inch piece of wood. Further, the paint on the wood matches paint on other items in McDonald's apartment. So we're to believe that at least four people, at least four people, if you believe McDonald's story more than that, right, the four he sees 
and the people he hears. Let's say five or six people show up at McDonald's house and they don't even have the piece of wood with them that's used to attack the people in McDonald's apartment. Well, let's talk about the ice pick. You've heard that the victims are stabbed several times with an ice pick. Now, Jeffrey McDonald claims that the family didn't have an ice pick. If that's true, then these five or six people, minimum, came to the scene with an ice pick to kill McDonald's family, right? Because they didn't bring the wood. Here's the problem, right? The couple actually used a babysitter in the past. Let's remember, the kids are two and five. Right, the couple used a babysitter, Pamela Callan. And while McDonald claims that the family didn't have an ice pick, the babysitter used the family ice pick in the past. Right, not only that, you had another member of the military. Let's remember, this is a military base. Right? This is Fort Bragg. You have a friend, Ron Harrison, a friend of Dr. McDonald's, who says that he's at the apartment in 1969 during a Thanksgiving visit. Now let's do the timing. McDonald's not in the apartment that long, folks. Right? The murders take place early 1970. So understand, this guy's telling you that just a few months before the murders, he's at the residence. The fact that it's Thanksgiving, a special day of the year, not any day of the year, a special day of the year, in my opinion, increases the credibility of his memory. You remember the singular events more than you do, let's say, a mundane day. Warren Harrison claims that he's there in 1969 during a Thanksgiving visit. And Jeffrey McDonald, while they're fixing things up, asked the question, where's the ice pick? Right, Harrison says that he hears it from McDonald. By the way, Harrison's a regular visitor at the house. His DNA is found in the house. Right? The DNA supports the notion that Harrison visits the house. Harrison is saying during his visit on Thanksgiving of 1969, McDonald went looking for the family ice pick. Right? Let me say this too. There are other people who are over at the house. Colette's mother. Right? Mildred Kassab who talks about how she was at the house and recalls getting the family ice pick, right, to loose up, loosen up ice trays. Let me point out, too, that the babysitter, Pamela Callan, I'm naming names so you can look at the record talks about how the ice pick was left at the top of the refrigerator. People in the family knew where the ice pick was, at least the adults. You don't want your two-year-old walking around with an ice pick. So this ice pick's at the top of the fridge. The point here is that the evidence contradicts Jeffrey McDonald's statements. Right? The family had an ice pick. Understand. The less weapons 
that the alleged intruders bring into the apartment for this home invasion murder. The less likely McDonald's story is true, right? It's hard to believe strangers would just show up in your house to murder people, to murder a pregnant woman, a five-year-old, a two-year-old, right? That's hard to believe on its own, right? They show up at the house. Think about the logistics of it. They show up at the house, a grown man on a military base where you understand these are members of the military. These are people who are prepared to defend the country, right? You would assume they're prepared to defend themselves. They show up, they see a man. They don't even have to know that he's a Green Beret. You show up, you see a man who's sleeping in the living room. And you decide that this is the house that's in a complex, right? In other words, they have neighbors. This is the house where you're gonna kill people. And of course, you go into the house to kill people and you don't bring with you the club that's used to club them to death or the ice pick that's used to stab them to death. Well, let's go further. There's a Geneva Forge knife that McDonald tells the police he pulls out of his wife. Right? McDonald, of course, claims that he didn't know where this knife came from. It wasn't the family's knife. Right? In other words, the wood, McDonald knows nothing about the wood. We find out the wood's from the apartment. The ice pick, McDonald knows nothing about the ice pick. We find out the family had an ice pick. The Geneva Forge knife, right? McDonald claims he didn't see this knife before. Now, the knife's distinctive because it's bent. Bent knife. Well, the babysitter. And I concede here she's been inconsistent in her testimony about this knife. <clears throat> but understand, she told CID, an investigative arm of the military, she told CID investigator Richard Avila that she saw a knife exactly like the Geneva Forge knife in the McDonald residence several times in the kitchen drawers, right? She said she recognized it because of its bent blade. This is before the murders that she notices the bent Geneva Forge knife. Right? Think about it. If we believe the babysitter, <clears throat> and the babysitter, as far as we know, has no reason to frame the family. If we believe, or at least to frame Dr. McDonald, right? The other members of the family are brutally murdered. If we believe the babysitter, then understand, both the ice pick and this knife, distinctive knife with a bent blade, were in the apartment before the murders. Now let's continue. The telephone that Dr. McDonald uses in the house to call the police is relatively clean. And that's surprising because the scene, of course, is extremely bloody, right? Very bloody scene, very bloody scene. McDonald claims that before he made the call, he tried to help his wife, right? She's been bludgeoned with a 31 inch wood stick. 
She's been stabbed many times with an ice pick and a knife. Right? McDonald, as you can imagine, would have blood all over him. Now, he claims under these circumstances, he may have rinsed himself off before making the call. Is that believable to you? Let's say you wake up, three guys are in front of you, you hear your pregnant wife and your young daughter screaming. Right? You tussle with these guys, you're knocked unconscious. You come to, you go into the master bedroom, your wife is there with two broken arms. She's bleeding badly from dozens of stab wounds. You see the word pig written on the headboard. And at that point, you decide you're going to go to the bathroom to rinse off before you call the police. The phone has very little blood on it. I believe McDonald figures out that that's a mistake on his part. So he then talks about how he finds his wife, then decides to hit the bathroom. To this observer, this part of McDonald's version of events is not credible. Understand, the more parts of McDonald's story that aren't credible, the more likely it is that he did this crime. By the way, in his initial statement to CID, the Army Investigative New uh, Unit, he couldn't explain why the phone was clean. Couldn't explain it. The bathroom story comes up later. Right? It's later that he claims he may have washed his hands. Now let me ask you, you find your pregnant wife, right? Or if you're a woman, you find your dead spouse brutally murdered. Brutally murdered after you yourself were attacked and are coming out of a concussion. Right? Would you even consider washing your hands at that point. Let's continue. <clears throat> McDonald, according to forensics, appears to have been wearing gloves when he writes the word pig on the headboard in the bedroom. Right? I believe this is a huge mistake by him. Huge. Right? McDonald makes the mistake of leaving the tips of the surgical gloves beneath the headboard. Now here's the problem. The tips of the gloves found beneath the headboard are identical in composition to the supply of gloves that McDonald left in the kitchen. Put bluntly, the alleged intruders who didn't bring the wooden club, who didn't bring the ice pick, who didn't bring the Geneva Forge bent knife, also didn't bring the gloves that were used to write the word pig on the headboard. Right, folks? The tools of these brutal murders are all from inside the house, the apartment. Now let's talk about McDonald's pajama top. <clears throat> he claims the intruders tried to take it off him and that he was able to keep it around his wrist. In other words, I wake up, there are three guys, three guys and one woman, right, around me. The three guys are attacking me. This woman 
is supposed to be holding a candle and doing chants. Figure that one out. Right? The three guys then get my shirt over my head. And I'm like this. In other words, I'm struggling and stuff. They've gotten my, you know, pajama top over my head, and I'm like this, right? Fending off three guys, right? Three guys. This is while my pregnant wife and kids are screaming in another room. Well, understand this pajama top is pivotal to the case. Now I believe without the pajama top, without the top, Dr. McDonald looks guilty of sin to me. With the pajama top, there should be absolutely no doubt. Right? McDonald claims that when he finds his wife in the master bedroom, and she's bleeding and dying that he puts the pajama top over her, right? That version of events from McDonald is a mistake. Understand the forensic evidence shows that his wife's ice pick stab wounds are made through McDonald's pajama top. Right? The pajama top had 48 ice pick holes in it. 48. Because of the folding and positioning, they could have been made by 21 stabbings of the ice pick. Which, folks, is the exact number of times Colette was stabbed with the ice pick. In sum, the holes in McDonald's pajama top line up with his wife's ice pick stab wounds. Someone put the pajama top on his wife and then stabbed through it. Right? Let me say this too. It's not just the holes, it's the fibers. Right? The fibers from McDonald's pajama top don't line up with a story. They appear places where they should not. His original statement to the CID, again, the military's investigative team, says that he found his wife bludgeoned and bleeding, lying down in the bedroom, right? She's lying down. That's his original statement. Now, in my opinion, one of the few memories in your life that should be unambiguous is the memory of the positioning of your spouse's body when you find that they've been stabbed, when you find that someone has tried to murder them, right? She's lying down when McDonald finds her. But yet, his pajama top fibers are also found under her body. Right? She's lying down, bludgeoned, to the point where both of her arms are broken. <coughs> broken. And yet somehow, fibers from McDonald's pajama top are under the body. So McDonald understood that he made a mistake with that statement to the police. Right? After McDonald finds out that his fibers are under the body, that his fibers are found where they shouldn't be if she's lying down when he shows up, 
He changes his testimony at the later Article 32 hearing. He claims for the first time that he found his wife sitting up. I believe he makes the change because he understands that he has a problem with the fibers being under the body. He has to find a way to position his wife in such a way that she then falls back onto the fibers from his pajama top. Let's go further. He also claims that he took off the pajama top in the master bedroom. We'll call it the adult bedroom because we're about to talk about his kids. Yet his daughter's daughter Kimberly's blood is on his pajama top. Right? She is the one who wet the bed. The five-year-old. Now let me just say this, and it's something that benefited the prosecution greatly. By chance, literally by chance, the blood types of everyone in McDonald's family was different. So this is a pre-DNA era, but the prosecution was able, because of the blood types, to know which blood belonged to Christian, Kimberly, Colette, and Jeffrey McDonald. I don't believe McDonald thought of that when he gives his initial statement. So, of course, there's blood on his pajama top. He wants you to believe he goes to the master bedroom, sees his wife, takes off his top, lays it on her. She's already stabbed with the ice pick and stuff like that. It's just happenstance that the holes in his pajama top match the ice pick stabbing on his wife, right? He wants you to believe that while he had the pajama top around his wrists, the three men he tussled with had an ice pick and stabbed the pajama top, right? He wants you to believe that the holes in his pajama top are random and that they don't match up with his wife's wounds. His team had no real explanation as to why they do. But more importantly, we know the story is fictitious because his claim that he is never in Kimberly's bedroom with the pajama top is contradicted by her blood being on the pajama top. Right? Let's also talk, too, about the knives used. There are two knives used in these terrible murders. A Geneva forge knife, we've talked about it, bent blade, that the babysitter saw. And an old hickory straight blade knife. Right? Now just understand, just understand that McDonald tells the police that it's the Geneva forge knife, the one with the bent blade, that he pulls out of his wife. In other words, he walks in, this knife is sticking out of her. And McDonald wants you to believe that he pulls the bent blade knife out of his wife. Now the babysitter told investigators that that bent blade knife was already bent before the murders, that she saw it, right, at the McDonald residence, before the murders. But let me just say this. Understand, McDonald's version is a complete fraud. Complete fraud. Because the forensics establish that the Geneva Forge bent blade knife was never in his wife. 
all three victims were killed by the old hickory straight blade knife. So McDonald's story of seeing his wife and seeing this knife and pulling this knife out of his wife, the kind of story one would remember clearly. Right? Your spouse has a knife sticking out of them. Right? To these two eyes, you would remember which knife it was, whether it had a bent blade, how you pulled it out of them. That's a singular event. Right? We find out, according to forensics, that Colette was only stabbed with the old hickory knife. In fact, all three victims are stabbed with the old hickory knife. All three of them. There are other problems with McDonald's story. Let's remember, he claims he's in the living room. He hears his wife screaming. He hears at least one child screaming. There's three men in front of him and a woman chanting. The problem is Colette's trachea is cut. Right? She couldn't have cried out. <laughs> she couldn't have cried out. If you're a McDonald's supporter, you can say, well, maybe she was crying out before her trachea got cut. Right? I just find the fact interesting that the trachea is cut. In other words, the cries would have stopped once her trachea was cut. Let me also say this too. There are many other problems with McDonald's story, right? Let's dive into his personality. I think you'll find as you go through his testimony that he's a guy who has to stay in role. He's not what I call interactive. In other words, you ask him about facts that he's not prepared for. And his response is going to be, I'm a doctor. This is ridiculous. How dare you accuse me of murdering my family? Right? He can't actually answer the question that you've asked him. So, Let's talk about the grand jury. McDonald gets indignant when he's before the grand jury and falls apart. He calls the proceeding ridiculous. He asked the prosecutor, why don't you stick to the facts? Right? I encourage everyone to go through his statements to the grand jury, right? You're going to be astonished by how confrontational Jeffrey McDonald is. He's a guy who needed to be in power. He needed to have control. I got to tell you, if someone accused me of murdering my family, even if they were barking up the wrong tree entirely, right? I'm totally innocent. Part of me would be admiring the determination of the prosecution and at least trying to find the people who victimized my family. In other words, you know, if I'm before a grand jury or what have you and some prosecutor, you know, is aggressively trying to you know, convince the grand jury that I should be tried for murder. While I'm sitting there, an innocent man, thinking, wow, this group actually believes I killed the crime. Uh, I did the crime. 
I would also privately be thinking, you know what? I like this tenacity. Right? I hope when I get off, when all the facts come out, because the facts couldn't line up, right? When all the facts come out, I hope they keep the same intensity in continuing to investigate what happened. Now, that's not Jeffrey McDonald's mindset. Right? His approach is one of indignation. How could you even think I did this crime, even though he's the obvious suspect, right? Who's in the house, excuse me, the apartment with the victims? One person, Jeffrey McDonald, right? He wants you to believe other people are. But understand, he definitely was, right? He definitely was. But yet, of course, he's calling everything ridiculous. Even at his trial, he's not answering questions directly. He's letting the jury know, this is ridiculous. How could anyone think that I would kill my family? Right? This is with the wood having come from the apartment. He won't even own up to having owned an ice pick. Let's also talk about some other lies he tells the police, right? He claims that it's his two-year-old who wets the bed, right? That's his claim. It's his two-year-old Christian who wets the bed. He even has a story about leading Christian back to her room, right? Just understand that the forensic evidence shows that it's not his two-year-old. It's his five-year-old, Kimberly, who wets the bed, right? Think about it. We now know through science that McDonald is lying to the police about which kid wet the bed. Now that's significant because people will look the other way when a two-year-old wets the bed. But if the kid's five, people start to ask themselves tough questions. Why is this kid wetting the bed at five? What's going on in this household that has a five-year-old wetting the bed? Wetting her parents' bed. She's not even in her own bedroom. Right? So, what I want to do here is I want to read the prosecution's theory of what actually happened that night. Right? I think it's very important. Very important. And for this, I'm going to turn to Wikipedia again. Right? This is from the Wikipedia explanation of the crime. Now, I've reviewed a lot of material on this case. I believe this Wikipedia summation properly summarizes the prosecution's version of what happened that night. Please indulge me. I'm going to read a couple of paragraphs here. In fact, I'll read three paragraphs. They're a bit lengthy. The McDonald family all had different blood types, a statistical anomaly that was used to theorize what had happened in their house. Starting with the assumption that there were only four people bleeding in there. Investigators theorized that a fight began in the master bedroom between McDonnell and his wife, Colette, who possibly argued over Christian, right, the two-year-old, wetting his side of the bed while sleeping there. Investigators speculated that the argument turns physical, as she probably hit him on the forehead with a hairbrush, which resulted in his head wound concussion. 
as he retaliated by hitting her first with his fists and then beating her with a piece of lumber. Kimberly, whose blood and brain serum were found in the doorway, may have walked in after hearing the commotion and was struck at least once on the head, possibly by accident. Believing Colette dead, McDonald carried the mortally wounded Kimberly back to her bedroom. After stabbing her, right, and they say whose blood was discovered on his pajama top, which he said he had not been wearing while in her room. McDonald then went to Christian's room, intent of disposing of the last potential witness. Before he could do so, Colette, whose blood was found on Christian's bed covers and on one wall of the room, apparently regained consciousness, stumbled in and threw herself over Christian. After killing both of them, McDonald wrapped Colette's body in a sheet and carried it to the master bedroom, leaving a smudged footprint of her blood on his way out of Christian's room. CID investigators then theorized that McDonald attempted to cover up the murders using articles on the Manson family murders that he had found in an issue of Esquire in the living room. Putting on surgical gloves from a medical supply in the hallway closet, he went to the master bedroom where he used Colette's blood to write pig on the headboard. He laid his torn pajama top over her dead body and repeatedly stabbed her in the chest with an ice pick. He then took a scalpel blade from the supply closet, went to the adjacent bathroom, and stabbed himself once. Finally, he used a telephone to summon an ambulance, discarded the weapons out the back door, disposed of the surgical gloves and scalpel blade, and lay by Colette's body while he waited for the military police to arrive. On April the 6th, 1970, Army investigators interrogated McDonald. Less than a month later, on May the 1st, the Army formally charged him with the murder of his family. Folks, I believe that's exactly what happened. Right? Exactly what happened. There's much more to this case. Right? Friends of the McDonald family have put together an excellent website. It's called the JeffreyMcDonaldCase.com. I invite you to go to that site to look up witness statements, a listing of inconsistencies and in testimony, and things of that nature. Let me also point out, too, that many of the published decisions in the case are online. I would encourage you to look up the published cases, you're going to find that many of McDonald's arguments, many of them, are simply procedural arguments. The claim that he didn't have a speedy trial. Right? You're going to find that much of McDonald's request for DNA testing and things like that are the results and what have you. Don't point away from him. They simply don't. Right? You're also going to find out that the neighbors don't support McDonald's story. Again, three men are in the living room. One woman is in the living room. McDonald is claiming that he hears screams of his wife and at least one daughter. How many people are in the house? How could no one have seen a van or a couple of cars pull up? 
And if, if five or six people minimum decided to go into an apartment for mischief, if you walk in the apartment and you see a member of the United States military, folks, this is at Fort Bragg, sleeping on the sofa, do you even stick around? Also, the candle that the woman with the floppy hat is supposed to have with her, where'd she get that candle? Understand, the candle's lit. She's supposed to have a candle and she's supposed to be chanting. How come no neighbors see someone with a lit candle enter the McDonald house? Right? McDonald's story just doesn't add up. I believe they have the right man in prison. He has no real explanation, none whatsoever, about why the holes in his pajama top match up with his wife's wounds. Let me point out, too. Some of the holes in his pajama top are holes to the back of the pajama top. McDonald isn't injured in the back. <laughs> so McDonald's defense really isn't substantial. He wants you to believe that while his pajama top is wrapped around his wrists, He's being attacked with an ice pick that's leaving holes that just happen to correspond with the wounds on his wife's body. Also, one wonders, three guys, McDonald claims they come at him so hard they give him a concussion. Keep in mind, McDonald dabbled in boxing. They give this Green Beret a concussion. And of course, while this group is so depraved that they're murdering a two-year-old, that they're not just murdering, but they're breaking the arms of McDonald's wife, we're to believe that they leave McDonald alive. Right? Just doesn't add up. Right? McDonald's wounds were the type where he was able to get discharged from the hospital quickly. Right? It just doesn't add up. The 31-inch piece of wood, the primary weapon that they use to bludgeon people, comes from the house. There's no they, folks. There's just Jeffrey McDonald murdering the key people in the case. Let's not get too carried away with Jeffrey McDonald. Let's remember Colette, Kimberly, Christian, and the unborn child. Guilty as charged. Jeffrey McDonald belongs where he is. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. If you're a McDonald supporter, please don't hesitate to leave your comments in the comment section of this video. I suspect I'm going to hear a lot about Helena Stokely. I want people to research that individual. Ask yourself, is this some troubled young person, right? She ends up dead in her early 30s. Is this some troubled young person who McDonald is just trying to frame for the murders? Right? Blame, distract us, throw out a remote possibility? Or is this someone for whom there is actual evidence that she was in the house that night? Meaningful evidence. Right? Also, what I want people to do is to go to the JeffreyMcDonaldCase.com. They have an excellent section on the lies Jeffrey McDonald told law enforcement. 
right? If he's completely innocent, why would he tell a series of lies to law enforcement? Why is his story evolving? She's lying down when I find her. She's sitting up when I find her. Right? Do you believe hippies who aren't wearing gloves, according to McDonald's own version of events, who aren't wearing gloves when they're attacking him in the living room? Right? Why would they suddenly decide to put on surgical gloves that, oh, by the way, McDonald has in the apartment to murder his wife and kids? Right? How, too, do you reconcile McDonald's claim that he sees his wife, takes off his pajama top, puts it over her, right? With the fact that his daughter's blood is on the pajama top. Right? I just don't think in the 1970s, when my father and I were researching crimes as a hobby, I just don't believe we had the resources then that we have now. The multiplicity of informational sources. Looking at this from a 2018 perspective, I believe it's clear that this guy is a murderer. I believe it's clear that this guy is a psychopath. Right? The fact that he went to Princeton, the fact that he's a Green Beret, the fact that he was extremely popular in high school, most likely to succeed, doesn't negate the fact that he's also a psychopath. That's how I see it. I look forward to hearing your comments. Thanks for stopping by.